So in this series, The Comforter Has Come, we will be sharing the practical side of moving in step with God. Tonight, we're going to open up the scripture to the fruit, the gifts, and the offices of the body of Christ. Everyone say amen. amen. I love to share the scriptures with you, yet besides just sharing them with you, I get energized in my heart when I see you really listening and really going after the word. And I, I can see the word, I got the hiccups again, producing fruit in your life. Man, and Jesus says, now you are clean through the word that I've spoken to you. All right, my next paragraph, God always has order and structure. Everyone say, God is not confused. And folks, remember this, where there is confusion, God is not. If you're around a bunch of people and they're all chattering and confused, you better bind all that up because God is not manifesting. Can you say amen? Okay, God's not the author of confusion, it says. So, follow up. God always has order, structure to everything that he does. For many Christians, this kind of understanding that I'm going to give you tonight helps us see how the kingdom, its gifts, its offices function. Many innocent believers misunderstand some of these important gifts and how they function. In fact, a lot of times you ask them questions and they just sort of got this case of raw bungle, um, I don't know, thing, and they don't quite have all the things in order. God wants us to understand the patterns, the reason why he does things. Can you say amen? There are five points underneath that we're going to cover. Number one, in this last session, there are two of you. Can anybody tell me what two are you? Flesh and spirit. So we're going to talk about that first before we get into the offices and the gifts, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So there are two of you, for flesh and spirit. Our flesh produces works, okay? It was built to work, but without the one motivating us to do the work, it's a dead work. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 6. We need God inspiring us to do the work, or it's going to be, a, it has no energy in it. Okay, so, the flesh produces works when our spirit produces fruit. Say fruit, fruit. works. works. So, which one should tell which one what to do? Your fruit to tell your works get together, you know. Anyway, so let's go to point two. Grace, motivational gifts. We're going to cover that real quickly tonight. God in us, through grace, motivates us and inspires us to do certain things. Some of you like to paint. I know Amanda back there likes to do certain art and put things together. That's really great. Um, gosh, BJ, there's a lot of things. There are writing plays. There are all kinds of things that she likes. Well, I'm trying to find something different, you know. Of course, you have probably 19,000 others I don't know about. So grace, motivational gifts, you need to know about those. So we're going to cover those real quickly. We're going to cover spiritual gifts. Everyone say spiritual gifts. They're not gifts of the flesh. They're spiritual gifts. These gifts are the functions and the expressions in which a believer, as the Holy Spirit moves through them, leads, okay? Then fourthly, we're going to study the five-fold office gifts. Everyone say the ministry gifts or office gifts. How many know that the person is different than the office? And the office is different than the person, right? And the person's in the office, okay? So we'll, we'll just kind of give you a, a little preview. And then number five, point five, God, the architect's plan, and the pattern given to follow. This is the last giftings. This is what we call the architectural gifts of the Spirit. Okay? Now, we're going to go to every one of them. And so they're in your notes, so follow along. Text. You should go to the place where it says text. I'm sorry we don't have notes for you up there, but 
Just write the addresses down and listen intently if you can. All right, your text is Galatians chapter 5. So if you grab your Bible there and go Galatians 5. We're going to look at um, verse 16 through 26. I'm going to read rather quickly, pointing out, out just a couple of things, all right? So starting at verse 16, he says, Paul is speaking to the Galatian, the churches at Galatia. I say then, walk in the spirit. Remember the word in. That doesn't mean out. It means in. You're in place. You're in the car. You know, you're in your house. You're in the spirit. That means you're not doing it from your flesh. You're doing it from the core of your being, okay? Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Everyone say amen. amen. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one and another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under that law. Then it goes on, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh. Everyone say works of the flesh. All right, so this is a snapshot of what happens to a, a fleshly person without God. This just shows what a person can do without God's guidance. So it gives us a list of them. And there are nine of them. Interesting, there are nine fruit of the Spirit, and there are nine works of the flesh. So that are listed, kind of offset one another. Okay, eh, a little trivia there for you. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Watching people, you can see, which are adultery, fornication, sex with another partner that you are not married to, uncleanness, lewdness, cussing and all, uh, uh, idolatry, sorcery. I'm just going to go through them. Sorcery, okay, um, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. Huh? Listen. What's that one? Ascensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, rivalries, uh, excuse me, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice, everyone say practice, See, a Christian doesn't keep on sinning the same way over and over because they have Jesus in them, and Jesus won't let them do that. They'll get convicted. They'll cry. They'll break down. Every time they go out and try to sin, there's something in their heart now because they're Christian telling them, no, 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 listen to it. But those who practice these things are not Christians. That's what he's talking about. These are people that just don't know any better. Those who practice such things will not inherit the what? Everyone say inherit the kingdom of God. Now, folks, I, I had a father, and he gave me an inheritance. That means when he passed away, I got something. I'm not trying to amplify that part. The part is that people who live like this, who don't have Jesus, have no godly inheritance. Are you with me? But the wrath of God comes down upon them. But it lists all the depravity. There's a lot of places that list it. So what a lot of Christians will do when they read this, they'll go, gosh, I better not ever commit this. I better not ever do that. No, I'm just saying that's what your flesh is capable of doing when you don't subject it to God. Remember, who's to meet with God first thing every morning? There we are. Amanda, who are we? We're going to meet with God every morning. Amen. Even if you get up at noon, Carrie. <laughs> All right. So, so look what it says. So, it says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The word inherit means they can't receive the things of God. Why? Because they're carnal. All right. Everyone say, I got it. Let's not read a whole lot of stuff into that, okay? Because you're not practicing this, right? But look at the next contrast. This is what your spirit has in it. Verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit, notice the works of the flesh, versus now the fruit of the spirit is love. Whose love do you have in your spirit? God's love. 
Peace. Whose peace do you have in your spirit? Whose patience do you have in your spirit? Whose kindness? Whose goodness? Whose faithfulness? Whose gentleness? Whose self-control? Listen, if you listen to your spirit, you'll lose weight. Against such, there is no law. You know, then it goes on. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become con conceited. <laughs> hey, I'm part of the first church. Provoking one another. Let's not provoke one. Hey, I prayed four hours today. How much did you pray? Hello? Comparing one to another. Here's another thing that happens. Satan is a master at working factions. So let's say somebody all of a sudden becomes your friend. And somebody who was your friend says something about your new friend. And now you're divided because your old friend has insulted your new friend. And now you're at the arms. Guess what? You're all wrong. You're a bunch of screw-ups. You don't get caught between two things. You're only caught up in God, right? All right, so don't. That's called divisiveness. The saints a master at it. He use people against friends against friends, uh, church people against whatever. You start working this, you know. Oh, you were this and you were that. Never, never. Here's another one. God just told me this. Never rebuke an elder. In other words, if somebody is older than you, or a pastor or somebody in leadership, don't you run around correcting them. You get somebody to go with you and be humble about it and say, hey, maybe there is something wrong. Hey, Carrie, I wanted to tell you that you're, you only got one leg. <laughs> and I brought a witness to confirm that with you. All right, so you, I'm laughing about it. But the idea, there's a lot of little things we do to trip us up. They're little foxes. We want to watch out. When the Holy Spirit has me spit one out in the sermon, it's for somebody that's listening. Okay? And that's all that's for. I don't know. All right. So look at the word note right there in your notes. God desires fruit. Do you believe that? Yeah. Now, we know with the Cain and Abel, he desires a sacrifice. But in the New Testament, he wants us to produce fruit. Fruit, it says in John 15, herein is our Father glorified that we bear much fruit. Can you say amen? So God desires fruit, not works. The works of the flesh shows a snapshot of how depraved the flesh can get without God. Got the hiccups again. Why do you have the hiccups so much? I don't know. But while God lives in us from, from our heart, we produce fruit. So think about it. The Bible says if you have God in your heart, it's like a seed. And if the seed remains in you, you won't practice sin, it says in 1 John 3. All right, so let's go to my next first point. The five-fold ministry offices. Everyone, you got that point there in your notes? You'll find that in Ephesians 4, starting at verse 7. All right, now, if I'm in the office, listen carefully, everybody eyes up here, I'm not the office. I'm in the office, but I'm not the office. Christians sometimes put a person has an office like an apostle or a prophet, they think that that's who they are. No, they're just in that godly office. They can make a mess in that office as good as they can do a good job in that office. But the office belongs to God. And here's the problem. Satan knows. Let's say you have a real turkey who's in the office of a pastor. I'll use my office. I will have to answer for God if I'm the real turkey. That turkey has to answer to God. But when Christians start criticizing that person, what do they have to go through to get to that person? The office. And the office is God. God's office. So here's how Satan does it. 
Somebody acts up and they fall and we start lambasting that person and then they're in a very important office of God. We just brought a curse down on ourselves. Because we're criticizing other offices and Christians. We have no... Bi- Listen, if I can encourage you, don't do that. You might feel justified to criticize some things. It'd be very, very tread on light water, man, because that's God's office. He's already going to deal with the person that messes the office up. Okay? And if I mess my office up, he's going to deal with me. That's because you're praying for me, right? So that could be... You know, everybody wants somebody in the office to be a hero. You know, we're we're in a hero society. The only hero we need is Jesus. He's our hero. No man is a hero. I'm not Flash. Hello? I'm not Batman, even though I got an insignia on the back of my phone. All right, so let's go on past that. Now, the five-fold ministry office... Verse 7, look what it says. But to each one of us. Notice what it says. But to each one of us, say me, was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, if Amanda is a prophet, and Peter is an evangelist, then the grace is coming for each of those gifts. Is, is going to be for that gift. If I'm an elbow, I'm going to have the grace to operate as an elbow. If I'm a pastor, I've got to have pastoral grace. Can you say amen? Because you can tell somebody really is a pastor or somebody really is a prophet because the grace of that office is on them. Hello? And I don't see too many New Testament prophets. There's a lot of proclaimers, but not too many prophets. Those are the ones that can pick you out of an honest audience and tell you your name, having never known you, tell you what you've been doing in good things, and then tell you what God wants to do in the future. That's a New Testament prophet. Okay? No ifs, ands, or buts, and there's very few of them around. Because people in the New Testament, the light Christians, I call them, we call them the cruisomatics, deify those offices. Ooh, we're a prophet. Don't ever do that in the New Testament. We're the servants of all. Can you say amen? That means we teach by example, not by calling meetings and rubbing our shoulder and giving out words. That is deception. Deception. Of course, it's also my opinion. <laughs> all right, so let's go on past that, all right? Verse 8 says, and he says, therefore he said, he who ascended up on high, that was Jesus, he led captivity captive. Who are the captives that Jesus led captive? Where were they? Egypt. No, they were in Abraham's bosom. Jesus went down into hell and liberated paradise in Abraham's bosom. All the Old Testament saints were liberated. And when he rose from the dead, the graves were open in Matthew. And it says he led captivity captive and gave gifts. That's what we're talking about to men and women, you know. Are you with me? Okay. What does it near also, but he also descended into the lower parts of the what? The earth. So did Jesus go to the lower parts? Yeah. So somebody said, well, Jesus never went to hell. Well, there it is. He went right down to the lower parts. It's called hell. The pit, Sheol, Tartarus, lake of fire. And there was a place called Abraham's bosom that no longer exists. Are you with me? He who described what he descri- descended Excuse me. He who descended is also he, the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. When Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, everything was settled. Here's something. Your salvation. You don't earn it. You don't win it. But when you receive it, it's eternal in the heavens. No one can take it from you. Hello? They have to crawl up into heaven to strip it from you. But you can 
renounce it, but nobody hears that stupid. Can you say amen? amen. Then it goes on, verse 11. And he himself also gave to some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Notice it's pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry until the edifying of the body of Christ, that's the building up of the body, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature or perfect men who of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. You can tell people they're tossed to and fro. They're not grounded in love. They're not grounded in scripture. And they have no prayer life. Okay? That's why they're tossed all over the place. They're running by their head. Okay? Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, teachings, false teachings by men. And the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deserve, deceive you. But learn to speak the truth in love. That you may grow up in all things into him. Into him. Into him. So you're growing into him. Who is the head? Even Christ. And from whom the whole body joined together and knit together by every joint. All of us are working together. Effectively working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body of the edifying itself in love. You know why we're growing? Because you're going out there and telling people good things are happening here. You're sharing what you're learning. Keep it to yourself and God will call you on the carpet. Our job is to go out and preach it. Share. Don't preach the church. Preach the Lord. And if they want to come where you're at, bring them. Meet them at the door. Let's go on. Are you with me? A couple of points. One, point one. These are holy offices. Do you know what the word holy means? Huh? Set apart. Very good. These offices are set apart by God. Okay? All right? Ordained by God. They are manned by a person. Called to that office. Two. Don't mix up the office with the human being in it. Can you say amen? We are just a human who is called to the office. So don't deify the human man. Can you say amen? Don't kiss his ring or anything. <laughs> Thirdly, we notice there's apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, right? So let me quickly go through them. Got to stretch out my leg there. It's a, it's a little bit tight there. Okay, the apostle. Everyone said, I'd like to know what an apostle is. They are like a glorified missionary. Their job is to go lay the groundwork and they start works. Uh, we can, I can think of a couple of them. Um, uh, Reinhard Bunke is a good one of a modern day. I don't know if he's gone on to be with the Lord yet or not, but he's a good one because he did all of those works. Uh, all kinds. Those apostle goes, starts churches. There are two kinds. There are the apostles that Jesus rose up. There's the ones that write scripture. And there are, those are the apostles that see Jesus in their life somewhere where Jesus actually calls them to start works. Okay? So a glorified missionary is a good way to put it. But they just don't do mission works like help the little children over in Botswana land. No, they're actually training ministers, laying groundwork, starting churches, raising people, laying hands on the sick. So an apostle will do everything that everyone below him can do as well. So an apostle can be a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. Hello. But a teacher can't be a, an apostle. And a prophet can't be an apostle. It's all there on down. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so what is a prophet? Well, there's a New Testament prophet. That's what I'm going to focus on. That's somebody when they speak, it happens. In the New Testament, they speak, it happens. In the Old Testament, they speak, and it's going to happen. But in the New Testament, they speak, and it happens. And that's why it's pretty rare. 
Now, we see people moving prophetically. That's okay. They speak and it happens. But somebody really moves in that gifts are pretty scary. Okay, so I don't want to go into more deep, deep detail than that. A prophet is somebody who brings forth what God wants at the moment and it comes to pass. Can you say amen? These people running around going, oh, Lord shows me you need to sell your dog and move to Florida. I can see something. All that, that's just new age crappy do. That's nothing. Listen, if God doesn't tell me first and you come to me and you say, God told me to tell you this and God's not told me, you're off the wall and take a seat. God only confirms through people what he tells you personally because he's your personal savior, right? Amen, Amen, Peter. (laughs) All right, so here we go. So you got the apostle, the prophet. Now we have the evangelist. Now here's what's funny. We we have evangelists coming into churches. The evangelist is not supposed to be in the church. He's supposed to be outside winning the souls, sending them to church. Now, I understand that some churches are so dead, they need some evangel, which means a revival. I'm, not, I'm just kind of trying to make it funny. But evangelists work the streets. They work out there, and then they send them to the local churches for training. Can you say amen? So evangelists have crusades, meetings. They preach the good news of the evangelists of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And then there's the pastor. Oh, bless him. He gets to stay around all the people. Evangelists can hit him and run. The prophet can tell him and shake him. And the apostle can lay out another foundation. But the pastor has to sit with him and teach him. No, that's what God chose me to do. I love it. I get to meet people. I get to minister to people. I can actually see if they will sit long enough and practice the word that God shares to them. They'll actually grow. But what the problem is for a lot of pastors is it, it, playing the politics. You get some people in there and, and they want you to do this and they want you to do that. A good pastor is going to follow God no matter what. And you know, those kind of pastors, listen to me carefully, usually don't have big churches. The big churches come from the professionalism and the concertism and all the money that's being spent with the musicians and and the pomp and the circumstances. Now, if your little church grows big, I don't blame you. That's God growing it. But if your congregation, if your denomination launches you out and gives you a million and a half dollar to buy your property and do all that, you know, that's good too. But let's, let's say the people who really preach the word start off with smaller works because it's not the fun and games like everything. It's not a circus. There's not the touch, the hoot, the hoot. People want to go to a show. Hello. So they want their church to be a show. They want their pastor to be a hero. And so the pastor can be a politician after a while. No, just going to be the pastor and pray for him. So pastor has to sit with the people, has to teach the people, has to counsel the people, has to listen to their wants and dislikes. And you know what? Jesus was a pastor. Amen. So it's a great call. I just wanted you to kind of laugh with me. And then teacher. Now, here's the deal. Can a teacher be a pastor? He can, but not all teachers are pastors, are they? But is every pastor, are they to be a teacher? Yes, because if a pastor can't teach, he's in the wrong office. Hello? Moving right on. So the apostle can do all the below, the prophet can do below that, the evangelist can do below that if they need to, the pastor can teach, the but the teacher cannot pastor, cannot evangelize, cannot do all. But there might be inklings of people being excited. So that's, these definitions for you are just to help you understand the offices and not to lock anybody in a permanent position. Some people are so legalistic. You say, I want you to do it this way. And they go, mm, 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 mm. they don't have any freedom nor joy. They just don't want to irritate anybody. You know, and they're not creative. They don't think. Hello, God doesn't want you to be that way. 
He simply wants you to enjoy yourself and do it according to scripture and have fun. It's supposed to be a labor of love, right? Let's move right on. So you see what those things are. Next point, point four. These offices equip the body for the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body and, and unifying it, knitting it together in love. All right, let's go to the next one. The grace-motivated gifts. Grace is what motivates us to do something. Grace is that special gift inside of you that God gives you where you're really good at certain things. How many has ever found a couple of things in your life, maybe a bunch more, that you're really good at it? You just kind of get in the niche. These, this is what it, and you, now we're going to go through these real quickly just to let you know what motivates you by God's grace, all right? Romans chapter 12, 3 through 8. So, and it says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me, Paul speaking to Rome, to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself. Let's stop right there. Let's forget the more highly than you ought to think. First key to a problem is stop thinking about yourself. All right, let's go on. Do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You got all the faith you need. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. See, grace for the gift. Grace for the gift. Grace motivates us in these areas. Let us use them. And then he lists them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in the proportion of our faith. Seven, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teacheth in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. And he who leads with diligence. And he who shows mercy with what? Yeah, can you imagine? I always like to do this. He that's showing mercy shouldn't look like this. Oh, I got to help you again. <laughs> That's not mercy. <laughs> I got to help you again. Pete, what are we going to do? All right, so let's go on. So notice a couple of points underneath that. And we're going to list them for you and talk just briefly about them. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. How many know that's dangerous? Because God resists the what? Proud. Proud, gives grace to the... I know it's so hard. Sometimes our flesh just wants to strut its stuff, but we can't. He said, don't think more highly than you ought to think. Flow with God and empty, and in, empty yourself and enjoy your life with him. Hey, whatever happened to running and playing and laughing with God? Hello? Well, I can't because everything else. No, yes, you can. You're looking at all the physical things. Sure can. You're supposed to be like a child. Not irresponsible, though. Okay, prophecy, in other words. Ministry, teaching, exhorting, giving, leading, and mercy. These are how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's the number of perfection? Seven. So these are in the body, but also in each individual of the body. So therefore, no matter where you go, these gifts can motivate you. Prophecy. Simple is this. This prophecy means somebody who declares the truth. You ever met one? Hey, I can tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> somebody... You always use that. Somebody drops a glass of water, right? Somebody who speaks the tr truth all the time will probably say something like this. I can tell you why you did that. You probably have secret sin in your life. Now, that would be the negative part of it. But see, a, a prophecy person just declares truth. And they have to 
balance that. Because you speak the truth in what? Love. So if they look at somebody like that, if they're operating in that gift by grace, they'll say, you know what? I, I, I want to tell you how to, for that not to happen again. So it's more of a positive truth telling. Can you say amen? Next one is what? Ministry. ministry. A minister is somebody that served. The other word for that is deaconos, or it means servant. So one declares truth and one serves. Okay? Next one is teaching. How many know what teachers teach? Did you know the negative part of a teacher is they get way too much in detail when they're trying to explain something to you and you completely lose the point because they're beating around the bush. Teachers need to get directly to the point and teach. Can you say amen? But because we like to study, I'm a teacher, and we like to have details and facts, we can get off on bunny trails, and you can do that in your conversation too. So teacher, let me tell you, one, two, three, and you'll not do that again, <laughs> okay? So I'll explain a little bit these real quickly. Exhorting, everyone say exhorter. What's an exhorter? That's a person that always telling you, you could do it. Get up here, you could do it. I'm making fun of it. You can, you can get that done. Come on, I'll be right there with you. They're exhorting you. They, they're they're kind of helping you out. Encouraging. Building up. Okay? Then givers. God fills churches with givers, but there are certain people, that's what their ministry is. And the first thing Satan does with them is get them to give their money everywhere else but where God wants them to give it. So givers have to be really on toes about their finances. Hello? So a giver, God puts them in the, in the church and they give to special projects and above and beyond their tithes. They're just, God gives them finances so they can become givers. Can you say amen? And the last one is mercy. Okay? Oh, I forgot the leader. I did on purpose. Nope. A leader. I would be a leader. Maybe a mom somewhere would be a leader. Okay. Leaders are more into telling people what to do than doing it. Hello? But we do, we, we do lead by example. I mean, everything you can imagine in church, I've done it. Sound, chairs, cameras. Because I've been in the ministry over 40, 45 years. I don't give or take a year or two. Okay, and we set up churches, tore down churches, set up ushers, did all this, trained, did all this kind of thing. So I am kind of seasoned, but guess what? All of these are supposed to do, if I did everything in the church, then what would you do? How would you feel welcome? And see, that's what people do. Sometimes they know they can do it. They trust that they can do it. And so they never ask anybody else to help and believe in somebody else. And that is absolutely a sin. Because Jesus didn't do that, did he? He gave all of his responsibilities to everybody else. So a good leader will train them and show them what to do, walk them through it three or four times, and says, it's yours. Just see me if you're having any problems. Hello? I wish people would do that more. And then, curse the leader, and then mercy. So let's see how they operate. So we have Denise tonight. She's coming in with a glass of a pitcher of water. She trips on the entryway rug because Amanda forgot to fix it. No, <laughs> making it all up. It's all made up. Sorry, Amanda. So she came, and by, by God's grace, she trips, but she drops the pitcher. Okay. It goes all over the floor. So we're going to look at these motivational gifts, how they look at it. Number one, okay, prophetic person will say, I can tell you why you did that. I'm just going to keep it simple. Okay? All right? And so the next person, ministry. I'll go get a mop. I'll go get a rag. See, they're serving, you see. Okay? And then the teacher says, I'll give you four points how to not do that again. <laughs> the exhorter. Here. It's okay. We'll do it together next time. We can do it. 
Just hold on to the picture tighter. Okay. The giver says, I'll buy you a new picture. I'll, I'll give you some more water. You see how they all function together? Everybody having these gifts? And the leader says, you, get a mop. You, sit over there with her. She looks a little shaken up. You, go into the kitchen. Get her another pitcher of water. Let's get all this thing. You know, bam, bam, bam. you know, we get blamed for a lot of stuff because we're telling everything what to do. But listen, somebody has to do it. I remember moving that piano over there, baby grand piano. We had 16 people over there. First thing I said to her, I got them all in a circle. Do they listen? I put them all in a circle and I said, we need one leader telling people what to do, not 16 people doing everything at once. Did they listen? They did everything once. The piano learned it ended up upside down and smashed apart and the trailer wasn't put on the right, but it still got over here without coming out of, out of tune. But nevertheless, you, God is in order, has order and conciseness. You're going to do a project. You better know those five questions. I'm going to go pick so-and-so up. Who's going to do it? What's it going to cost? What steps do I need to do it? You, you need to ask those questions constantly because people who don't think that way get things done a lot slower. And slow is not always good if it's a fire. <laughs> I always have people, well, I don't want to do it, though. I want to do it my way. Hey, there you go, selfish. Keep on doing it. I'll check in on you, see how you're doing. <laughs> That's not fun. Nobody wants to do that. So here we go. The teacher, the exhorter, the giver, the leader, and then finally, mercy. And so Sherry comes over, sits down, says, oh, Denise, I've done that a time or two. I'm just picking on names. It's not anybody for real. You know, I mean, you guys are for real, but I don't know if you. And you sit down, you put your arm around, and let's pray together. And see, because the mercy gifts is the feeler in the body. So you can see how they all operate. I have good teaching on it, extensive teaching on it, but we're doing all the gifts. So that gift's important. So all of you have some portion of these gifts operating in you. Can you say amen? So all these function within the body and without the body at home, where you're at, because these are the grace motivational gifts. The next one is the Holy Spirit's gifts. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Gifts in a believer. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 through 11. I'm going to read rather quickly. Okay. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, listen to this next phrase. I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried about with these idols that can't talk, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is my Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, and these are, there are differences or diversities of gift, but it's the same spirit. There's differences of ministries, but it's the same Lord. There are differences or diversities of activities, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's the same God, same God who works all in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation, the making known of the spirit is given to each one to profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom by the, through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one in the selfsame Spirit works all these gifts, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, there's a lot of information there. These are called the gifts of the Spirit in a believer. That means you have the Holy Spirit. He has all these gifts. Now, there are nine gifts here. Everyone say nine. Nine. They're in three categories. Okay? 
You got that over there, George, Pete? All right, you guys stop talking. All right, so. All right, so the administrative giftings of the body of Christ are done by the Spirit as the Spirit of God leads us. Therefore, we don't decide at one time what we're going to do or how we're going to prophesy. It has to be by the unction of the Spirit. So I broke them all down into three categories. Everyone said, what are those categories? Okay. All right, so under point three, these categories are vocal gifts, power gifts, and revelation gifts. Three in each. Vocal gifts, power gifts, and revelation gifts. Vocal gifts say something. Power gifts do something. And revelation gifts reveal something. Are you with me still? So, I'll just define them real quickly. I mean, again, I have... Lots of teaching on this because people don't. Got the hiccups. My third hiccup time. Um, he must be spiritual. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Are you with me, everybody? Okay. All right. So the vocal gifts are prophecy. This is a different kind of prophecy. Tongues, diverse kinds of tongues. And then the third one, interpretation of tongues. So these are the vocal gifts. Prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Say amen. amen. Prophecy is in the New Testament declaring something and it happens as it's being declared. Okay? And when you come to a church, it will be in a known language. So somebody who prophesies said, in the days to come, saith the Lord, and they'll say blah, 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 but it will be in our Known language. Okay? We don't need an interpreter. And then if the tongues, there's going to be a tongues for the church. It'll be allowed tongues. It's in order. And then there'll be an interpreter to interpret the tongues. Not translate the tongues. Interpret the tongues. There's a difference. So somebody will go, and Amanda will stay in the days to come. So she completes and it becomes a prophecy. So the tongues and the interpretation is as equal to somebody just speaking prophecy. Do you understand? Okay. There's two uses of tongues. There's your private in your prayer closet use. And there's the public use, which I am talking about right now. But you must have an interpretation of the tongues. Otherwise, it says, be quiet and sit down. Hello. So vocal gifts have three. What? Did you have a... I was going to say, who um, interprets? Um, Whoever is called of God's spirit. Usually, in a small church like that, it's usually the pastor. So we don't get some weirdness going around. All right. And also, when churches get bigger, we ask them to bring their prophecies up and read them to the congregation. If there's some finagery, usually they stumble on coming up. Can one person have all three done in the same time frame? Yes, they can. Somebody can prophesy, and then all of a sudden it gets switched, and tongues and interpretation. But that's by the Spirit of God. God directs it, because there could be some small helian guy sitting here, and all of a sudden you prophesy, and he doesn't understand a word because he's small helian. Next thing you break off in tongues and you start speaking small Ely. And next thing you know, he's interpreting his own language saying, fall down, serve God. This is I, God, who has brought you here today. Man, it says their hearts are revealed and they're convicted and they fall down. So there's a lot of use of that. We can't cover it all tonight because I can do two weeks just on that gift. Okay? So you just understand the shell. And notice something, a gift of the Spirit will never get out of order here because my wife won't let it happen. Okay, so the next, what? The vocal gifts. So you got those. Next is the power gifts. Everyone say power gifts. Power they do something. They are the gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healings. Okay? Gift of faith is the largest power gift. 
Because that's what Daniel pulled up a lion and fell asleep. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, a fourth man showed up because the gift of faith was in operation. Daniel again was delivered. Jesus asleep when the storms are rolling. Gift of faith operating. It's a gift whereby you believe God and trust God passively. You don't do anything. You just receive, receive, receive. That's where God really wants you to be, operating in the gift of faith. Okay? Then the second is working of miracles. Notice the word working. Working means there's some kind of working that you're involved in. Moses had a stick. Hello. He struck rocks and parted water. He was working in it, but God did the miracle. The prophet Elijah commanded the axe head to float. It's a working of a miracle. You see? Where the miracle is worked by obedience to God. You don't do it on your own. God tells you to do it, and you work it with God. Can you say amen? And then the gifts, plural, of healings. Many kind of healings. Mental, physical, Emotional, hello, spiritual. And gifts of healings are that supernatural gift to heal of what has been damaged. Okay? Now, it's one thing to be healed of something and then go for a week and get sick and then get healed of it again like a common cold. Well, wouldn't you rather, instead of getting sick and getting healed, sick, getting healed, wouldn't you rather, rather have divine health? Where you stay healthier, longer? Well, you have to get in the word for that. And you have to start a good prayer life. Otherwise, you're going to be tossed to and fro. Because you have no substance under your feet. You're just going on what you think is right. You can't go on what you think is right in the Bible. You have to go on what you know that you know that you know God wants you to do. And that's the difference. All right. So the next thing, what? The next is... The power gift, the gifts of healings. All right, the next, what power gift is it? Revelation gifts. What do they do? They reveal things. Paul got all of his teaching in the New Testament by revelation. John, we know it. He's the revelator. You and I know that when God reveals truth to us, Satan can't steal them. So the gift, the revelation gifts are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning or seeing spirits. Are you with me? The word of wisdom is a segment, not wisdom, a segment of God's wisdom showing you how to do something on how to get something done. Hello. You sit down to a project and say, God, give me a word of wisdom. Show me how you want it done. Then sit down and if you're under people, bounce it off your pastor or wherever, your boss, making sure you're not just hearing voices. Hello. Because you always double check everything and you always go up the chain of command because if you start jumping chains of command, you're actually doing the work of the devil because you're usurping authority. And that's what Jezebel did. You don't want to make up your own mind, do it. You're, oh, you know, hey, you know, brother, uh, I know you asked me to do it this way, so I did it that way, but I did it my way while I was doing it that way. No. You find out how do you want it done? When do you want it done? You know, that's what you got to find out in a little more detail. Anyway, so go on past that. So God reveals things to you. So the word of wisdom is knowing what to do and when to do it with all the teaching facts and things you have, and it's only a section of God's wisdom, maybe for that project. Then the word of knowledge is the word of knowing. You know past and present. And so if I'm in, in a congregation and I have a word of knowing, I know somebody might have a cancer. God has a cancer in his stomach. He wants to heal. Word of knowing. And then there's discerning of spirits. This is one that very few people have, but pastors should have, and that's the ability to discern what spirits are operating within your church or family or whatever. And discerning means to discern so far as to see spirits. And there are three sections to that. 
Dreams, visions are part of discerning his spirits. Hello? Having an open vision and seeing the spirit, not seeing spirits behind every bush, but they're, as they're revealed to you. I told you the one thing that I had as I was praying for this lady, as soon as I grabbed her hands, everything disappeared, and I saw the two spirits hooked to her skeleton and kidneys. Her body disappeared. Always there's skeleton kidneys in these two spooks. And I just said, I see you. And as soon as I said that, the devil says, uh-oh, I'm exposed. Satan doesn't want to be exposed. He doesn't want to be named, and he doesn't want to be called out because he is a cheap loser. And you call him out in the name of Jesus, and you point at him and say, and you say, well, I don't know what spirit's operating. What is the person doing? Are they lying? Then it's a lying spirit. Hello, are they cheating? Then it's a cheating. You don't have to get detailed. Just call it to what it is, what it's doing, and command it to stop. So discerning of spirits are very important. And I have that as a pastor. I know exactly where Christians are because I can see their countenance level. If they've been under stress or not, if their mind is kind of deposed or they're pre preoccupied in something else, I can discern that. Why? So I can share the word to help encourage. Not so I can lambaste you with it. <laughs> I know what you haven't been doing. But anyway, let's go on to the final one. The administrative gifts. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. Wow, I, I finally got almost through this. All right. Now you are the body of Christ, it says, and members individually. Verse 28. As God has appointed these in the church. Now listen, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers. Hey, that's kind of like the other one. And after that, miracles. Then the gifts of healings. There's a gift. Helps, administrations. Okay. Variety of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. These are the administrative gifts because these ones, remember the apostle comes in, lays the blueprints. The prophet comes in, prophesies the strength to the people. The teacher comes in to teach everybody about what they're supposed to be doing. Then God starts doing miracles, so the church fills up. Then somebody needs to be in administration to, to help people and find them, so they find direction where to go. Then there needs to be helps. Somebody needs to pick up the garbage and park the cars. And then there needs a diversity of tongues. This is not the tongues like speaking in tongues. This is the diversity of people talking to their own kind. Doctors talking to doctors. Lawyers talking to lawyers. Truckers talking to truckers. Wives talking to wives. And men talking to men on their own languages about the marvelous works of God, how we can get a church rolling and going for God. If you got something out of that tonight, would you give the Lord a praise? Amen.